when being confronted with the phrase anticipatory remembered present for the first time i can imagine that one could think why not just use the term conscious now or transient now however the anticipatory remembered present derives from the term remembered present which was coined by neurobiologist Gerald Edelman who was in turn inspired by American process philosopher William James by using this term Edelman wanted to emphasize that our stream of experience is basically a memory dependent conscious in the momentness or a conscious here and now that unfolds from previous experience how this works exactly we'll see further on in the presentation but the term anticipatory remembered present can be linked with the moment by moment advance of nature as it is described by physics and especially it can be linked with how nature's ongoingness is modeled in Reginald Cahill's process physics this is a neurobiologically inspired way of doing foundational physics in which an initially random noise driven process system self organizes towards rich complexity much like a neural network does now what's so special about process physics is that it has room for subjectivity it does not place subjectivity outside the physical world as mainstream physics does and most of all it has an inherent present moment effect this in contrast with mainstream physics which in fact needs an external time indicator to pick out which position on a given timeline is actually going to play the role of the present moment well to explain this in more detail let's discuss the following ideas first we'll take a look at how time is treated in mainstream physics especially in the form of geometrical timelines that require an externally added present moment indicator then we'll see how physical theory aims to represent a natural system's temporal evolution by using state-based time slices in combination with a geometrical timeline after that we'll take a look at how time is treated in cognitive neuroscience especially what it takes for a conscious now to occur at all the first element of which is perceptual categorization which is the ability to carve up nature into categories whereas nature itself does not contain any inherent categories at all second see how a uh, conscious now can become more anticipatory as is the case in higher order conscious organisms like ourselves this anticipatoriness is also a central feature of Cahill's process physics in process physics stochastic self-organizing activity patterns evolve in a neuromorphic fashion this is based on an underlying process of Darwinian like evolutionary selection. Accordingly, activity patterns that are strengthened by noisy update iterations will flourish, whereas activity patterns that are not strengthened enough remain obscure as they keep a low profile without any emergent orderly behavior. And remarkably, this has a lot of common ground with how neural networks develop in the brain after this we'll compare process physics with contemporary mainstream physics to point out the specific weaknesses of mainstream physics when it comes to the present moment effect and subjectivity and to explain how these two features are in fact prominent built-in aspects of process physics finally at the end of the talk we'll briefly turn to the implications for ecosystems what would happen if we were to adopt the process oriented paradigm of process physics when looking at neural pathways in the brain and trophic flows in ecosystems we can then find 
that healthy systems are capable of maintaining a critical balance between the fast efficiency of the beaten track and the slower going reliability of the other tracks less taken. And then the last point to be discussed will be about anticipatory openness in ecosystems which depends on the ecosystem's choice of investing in the efficiency of the fast single pathway or in the reliability of the slower reroutings of the less taken alternative pathways. Okay, let's start with the basics of mainstream physics. Regardless the conclusions from quantum mechanics about the inseparability of observing and observed system, Contemporary mainstream physics starts out with placing the observer outside of the system being observed and then decomposing this observed system into subsystems, constituent elements, system states, etc. For this reason, I like to call it exophysical decompositional physics. The most important aspects of uh, exophysical decompositional physics is that it takes on an external view from nowhere upon a target world that is considered to be entirely physical. In this way, subjectivity is again and again forced to be outside the observed target world. Otherwise, physics cannot even be made to work in the first place, because there is no universe of discourse to begin with. Also, the conception of the target world in terms of system states, etc., brings along another important characteristic. Namely, it makes us think of the physical world in terms of consecutive time slices, with each slice making up a frozen moment in time. Here we can see a tiny fraction of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, with the Moon spiraling around the trajectory of the Earth. Like this, the consecutive time slices of the Earth-Moon system can be imagined to follow along a timeline with an externally added present moment indicator just like on this ruler with pointers sliding along the entire length. Because of the consecutive order of the time slices every single time slice of the Earth and Moon system can be associated with one calendar day but it becomes immediately apparent that external manipulations are required to get from one day to another. In a calendar like this one, which is basically a deck of cards with one card for every day in the year, each card has to be removed by hand to get to the next day. There's nothing in the target system that justifies such an external manipulation, nor is there anything inside the model the timeline or the calendar that takes care of the transition from one time slice to the other. In Einstein's relativity theories this is solved by declaring that time is illusory and that in fact all time slices are equally real and exist all together at once. So although we normally like to think that time runs its course from the past into the future as we see on the left hand side. In relativity theory nature is thought of in terms of a four-dimensional space-time manifold, the so-called block universe. This would then look somewhat like the picture on the right hand side, but then on the scale of the entire universe. Now let's take a look at how mainstream physics tries to model nature via mathematical representation, more or less with a textbook example of mathematical modeling. Firstly, a target system is singled out as some interesting aspect of nature, such as the Earth with its orbital motion. Such an aspect of nature can be expressed by using physical observables, such as mass, position, speed, etc that can be specified in terms of numbers. Secondly, from the empirical data, a specific set of these numbers is chosen to serve as initial conditions. And then, after an arbitrarily short interval, a second set is chosen as the immediate successor of these initial conditions, 
the physical result of some physical operation that is going on in nature. Thirdly then, the numbers from uh, for the initial and the final conditions are inferred to relate to one another by a mathematical operation that closely matches this physical operation. In this way we suppose that the empirical data extracted from the so-called physical world is represented by the mathematical world whose calculated results will have to be interpreted in order to confirm their agreement with the actually observed final set of empirical data. But we must realize that the thus achieved empirical agreement is between data and algorithm, not between nature and mathematics, and that the process of nature itself, on the left, can only be approximated by mathematical inference. So there always needs to be an encoding of raw measurement results into more polished data that can be mathematically compressed into a short physical equation. And in turn, there's also always interpretational decoding that predicts from the physical equation what the numerical values of future measurement outcomes should be. For sake of simplicity, we can then place the second time slice or si system state, the physical and mathematical results in the lower boxes, on top of the one with the initial conditions to end up with what is also known as Robert Rosen's modeling relation. And what is now particularly interesting is that both the measurement encoding and the predictive decoding cannot be derived from the data or the algorithm itself. So analogously to the external present moment indicator, encoding and decoding are in fact external manipulations. Although they give shape to the physical equations, they rely on subjective choice. So at the end of the day, this encoding and decoding is manipulated by the background process of subjectivity which earlier on had been so carefully placed outside of physics by stating that all of nature is entirely physical. So mainstream physics cannot hold on to its supposed objectivity. That is, subjectivity turns out to be a crucial factor. But how then does subjectivity give rise to our nature dissecting gaze on which our way of doing mainstream physics is based? This is done by the process of perceptual categorization. Perceptual categorization is the process of carving up nature into categories, although nature itself does not contain any such categories at all. Through perceptual categorization, we gradually get to differentiate conspicuous foreground patterns from less relevant background patterns. To begin with, Incoming visual stimuli are channeled via the relay center of the midbrain to the visual cortex for processing and then back again. After this, visually processed signals are sent to the prefrontal cortex, which plays a role in linking sensory motor activity patterns with internal goals of the organism. This can occur, amongst others, because dopamine releasing reward systems in the brainstem region project specifically to the prefrontal cortex. Then also the premotor and motor cortex get involved so that they can set the musculoskeletal apparatus in motion. And like this, all these activity patterns reverberate all over the cortex. All these signals are initially relatively undirected in early life, but the release of dopamine and other neuromodulators more or less streamlines neural pathways that are at that time active. For instance, the motor circuits for grabbing and the visual circuits for optical focusing. In this way, we can develop habitually grooved action repertoires with a high level of not only specialization, 
but also flexibility to changing circumstances. This picture shows the dopamine pathways that specifically target the prefrontal cortex. And this second picture shows in simplified fashion what neuromodulators do. Neural pathways that are active use neurotransmitters to keep their action potentials going. By adding neuromodulators in the mix, synapses with a neurotransmitter concentration that is just below the threshold for triggering an action potential are lifted above the threshold so that the neuron can participate in the activity patterns of connected cells. So in this way, neuromodulator secretion streamlines brain activity. The resulting mutualistic activity patterns that are associated with our conscious stream of experience can even be visualized in a brain scanner using transcranial magnetic stimulation. During dreamless sleep, when a person is not conscious, stimulation by an electromagnetic coil above the head only leads to local activity in the cortex that will almost directly stop when the stimulating pulse is removed. This can be shown with this first video here. During wakefulness, however, activity patterns reverberate all across the cortex and persist even when the stimulating pulse is switched off. This can be seen in the second video. This culmination of memory-guided opportunity-seeking activity patterns of sensory stimuli and body-related signals is what facilitates the emergence of a conscious now as an anticipatory remembered present. Also, everything within and outside the organism is crucial to and participates in this emergent conscious now. In this way, what we usually like to think of as the external real world out there is not apart from, but a part of the process of experience. So, unlike the separation of target world and subjectivity, with which mainstream physics starts out, conscious experience and experienced world are both aspects of the same indivisible process of nature. As observers, we are seamlessly integrated parts of the same world we are trying to piece together by carving it up into small pieces and then putting those together again into an understandable whole. But in a sense, we are ourselves part of the puzzle we are trying to solve. We are embedded, brain-equipped observers that evolved within a universe that is itself brain-like at the level of galactic superclusters. That is, in the Millennium Run, which is an enormous simulation of galactic superclusters, put together by astrophysicists from the Max Planck Institute, the universe is actually neuromorphic at its largest scale of organization. This simulation shows that the universe at the level of galactic superclusters actually takes on the form of a giant neural network. And this is precisely the essence of process physics. Process physics is a neurobiologically inspired way of doing foundational physics that starts out with a, a noisy substrate to model the initially unlabeled structureless universe. So noise is used in process physics to model nature's initial absence of order. Because it is impossible to observe the early universe beyond the footprint left by cosmic background radiation, we can only make approximations about what was happening there. However, in process physics it is assumed that the universe started out as an initially uniform, basically orderless realm, or in other words, a noisy process planum. And because we, as later arriving observers, are in fact seamlessly embedded participants of this same process planum that we are observing, we can also quite commonsensically diagnose it as being self-referential. 
Now, process physics uses these two characteristics of noisiness and self-reference to realize a pre-geometric startup modeling of the universe, which is based on self-referential noise. This can be imagined like this buzzing and noisy picture here, although it must be emphasized that this is just an analogy and not the model itself, let alone nature itself. Each self-referential loop basically works to add the influence of the system's past activity together with additional noise so that the already present activity pattern can be renewed. So basically it has the effect of an update iteration. This is very similar to the process of neuromodulation in the, the mostly unconditioned brain of a newborn baby. It follows the same basic principles. Although in the case of the process physics model, there seems to be no starting structure like a pre-wired brain. So there is no pre-developed starting structure, but just random noisy activity patterns. Remarkably though, when there are enough iterations, more stable and relatively isolated branching structures start to emerge from the noisy background activity. These are emergent neuromorphic or neuron-like structures with an internal connectivity that approximates the geometry of a three-dimensional hypersphere. So these emergent process structures branch out so that they have a natural embedding within a three-dimensional hypersphere. So in this way they can basically be seen as bits of emergent geometry. After this, with more update iterations, even higher order structures can arise with emergent quantum behavior, a quasi-classical world with gravitational and relativistic effects, non-locality and also a present moment effect inherent to the system itself. And last but not least, it also exhibits the built-in potential to develop into a giant neuromorphic structure, this entirely in line with the outcomes of the Millennium Simulation. To give you an impression, this video shows an imaginary voyage through the universe at supergalactic scale, as calculated by astrophysicists from the Max Planck Institute in their Millennium Simulation. To recapitulate, we can compare exophysical decompositional physics against process physics and find that process physics has an intrinsic present moment effect, that it allows for the development of higher order subjectivity because of its neuromorphic mutual informativeness, and last but not least, that it is inherently noisy so that quantum indeterminacy, non-deterministic open-ended creativity and the emergence of novelty are logical consequences instead of unexplainable phenomena. All of this is lacking in our mainstream exophysical decompositional physics, so altogether it offers enough reason to start questioning contemporary mainstream physics and to embrace process physics as its more process-oriented alternative. Now let's see how process physics, with its noisiness and self-reference, could be useful in offering a new framework for dealing with ecosystems. By taking a neural network as an illustration, it can be shown how process physics leads to quite another mindset towards ecosystems than mainstream physics does. To begin with, during early development, biological neural networks have a relatively random connectivity with all neuronal groups synchronized so that most neurons share the same pattern of activity, with hardly any diversity. As the network develops towards maturity, it has a more modular group-related connectivity with more integrated, habitually grooved action repertoires that continuously shape and affect each other. So through this mutual informativeness between neuronal groups, the system is always open for novel connectivity. Metaphorically, we can say that the most frequently used pathways are like highways optimized for speed and efficiency, but there are enough parallel surface roads 
to provide alternative pathways in case of a major roadblock. In this way, the system as a whole can become efficient and reliable at the same time, so that context-specific skills can be perfected, but flexibility can be called upon uh, in case of changing circumstances. However, when the neural network starts to decay, connectivity may drop dramatically. In this situation, activity patterns remain mostly isolated within their own local region, so synchronization or exchange with other regions practically doesn't occur anymore. We can see that the healthy, mature neural networks uh, have the highest complexity, which means that it has the optimal balance between, on the one hand, efficient uh, specialization, and on the other hand, reliable redundancy, or in other words, the availability of alternative pathways to get the same functionality. And it is exactly this trade-off between single-track efficiency and multi-track reliability that we should aspire for, not only in ecosystems, but also to get a more healthy economic system. In this way, our economic system should be less based on optimization of profit and short-term return on investment, and it should adopt another way of attributing value, not on the basis of external consumption of scarce goods, but on the basis of participation. Participation within a system that is geared towards finding an optimal trade-off between antagonistic competition and symbiotic cooperation. In this way, more meaningfulness and less suffering for all involved creatures will automatically be achieved. At least, that is what I hope that will happen. And as it is sometimes said, hope makes you feel alive. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me on the All is Flux email address. So I can hopefully answer your question. Thank you very much.